so following suit of the of uh, Art and Stevens' uh, uh, fantastic talks, I'll sort of uh, maybe push this a little more uh, translational, getting at maybe some of the questions uh, you were hearing at the end of Stevens' talk on how do we actually get this into the clinic and, and drive decision making in a in a clinical arena. So the Sort of charter I have at uh, Mount Sinai and why you know Carl Icahn gave you know 150 million dollars to form this institute is uh, really to engage the digital universe of information you know beyond the sort of the classical you know what you would have scored in a hospital and just you know the entire digital universe of information and bring that to bear on models that are being built to inform decision making on a on a given patient. So when a patient walks through the door at Mount Sinai, the idea is can we better inform on that patient's condition and how best to treat that condition given the digital universe of information and how do we integrate it, build these models, validate them, and then apply them. Uh, and this is just a little reminder on how big the digital universe of information is. Um, in 2011, it was uh, going over uh, basically two zettabytes. So if you don't know what a zettabyte is, that's 21 zeros. Uh, so think for a zettabyte, think 60 billion 30 gigabyte iPhones, right? That, that's uh, about the scale, so it's a pretty amazing amount of information. And so if you want to play in the digital universe of information, you need you know, tools. You need uh, hardware that can manage that scale of information. You need people who know how to you know, work at that scale and compute on that information and transform it so that we can apply uh, the type of model building we, we want. And of course, uh, as we all know, a lot of this big data uh, revolution uh, is now being driven by, by the biological biomedical sciences. And one of the reasons for that are all the amazing technologies that are just rolling out and enabling ever, ever you know, deeper snapshots of, of these living systems. And this is just you know, showing you the cost curve for sequencing a human genome over the last plus decade. And, um, this is Moore's Law, so this is on log scale, and what you see is the cost dropping at a super Moore's Law rate, which again is a highly unusual trend that we don't see very often. So the idea is we're gonna generate lots and lots of information on lots of people, and we're gonna try to integrate that information to, to do something useful, and so these are just some of the domains of, uh, of uh, data that w we're seeing generated across uh, many thousands of individuals. In fact, some of the data I'll show today is generated on more than 25,000 people that we have in the Mount Sinai Biobank um, that are all consented. You know, Mount Sinai opted for this uh, you know, opt-in consenting for patients uh, coming through the hospital as opposed to most centers who are doing opt-out. So opt out, you're automatically enrolled, right? Unless you say you don't want to be enrolled. And, and the, so you can grow your numbers very quickly. But the problem with that is you can't, uh, they're de-identified. You can never go back and figure out who, who actually supplied you with that data. Whereas the opt-in strategy, um, we don't have to de-identify. We can go back, we can pull back to the individual patients. I can connect them directly to their EMRs. I can connect them to all the basic science data. I can pull into their families. Um, and so we're able to do things uh, like, uh, you know, almost science on the fly. So it's a, when Stephen talks about the publication, uh, you know, that the goal is publications, we can show how in just a few slides, or I could publish uh, uh, 20 papers in, in 10 minutes of querying through the, through the EMR database at um, Mount Sinai and this biobank. And what, what we're seeing here is a topological uh, map view of um, all the patients that are in the biobank at Mount Sinai where all of the nodes represent uh, individuals within that biobank, and we're looking over a number of clinical dimensions. I think in this case it was 40 or 50 dimensions we were looking at, uh, uh, at these patients, and we then wanted to assess their similarity using a bunch of different scores. We worked with IOSD on this. They're, they're the company, you know, this uh, uh, Gunnar Carlson, brilliant topology math guy at Stanford who uh, is revolutionizing the way we can cluster or group data based on topological uh, principles that we all thought in pure math would never see the light of any practical use, but now we're uh, actually using them. And so we're looking at a bunch of these uh, uh, clinical uh, variables over the 25,000 uh, individuals, and now we've color-coded uh, those nodes by um, uh, diabetes uh, uh, phenotype. So are you uh, close to either being diabetic or pre-diabetic uh, all the way to being uh, non-diabetic? And what we immediately see in this sort of projection um, is, is uh, these two 
uh, groups being uh, spatially separated. And then, of course, you want to say, well, why, you know, why are they separated? So now what we can do is go and take all of the whole exome typing that we did on these individuals, and we can just screen those two groups on the fly to say what are the genetic variants that may describe differences between uh, these two groups. And so for this group A of patients over here and group B of patients over here, we get a pretty nice hit of a, a calcium channel gene, a SNP that's near a calcium channel gene. And when we uh, do a little search on uh, that gene, we see that this is a gene that's been implicated uh, for type 2 diabetes uh, previously. So it's sort of a nice um, uh, validation hit. But what's interesting is this relates to calcium function and its association to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So now we can go and search the EMR for calcium-related traits and reproject that onto the map. And what you're looking at here is the calcium uh, significantly uh, uh, high in a particular group uh, versus low. So these are using some of the biochemical measures that get scored for diabetic patients. And we again see, uh, remember the two groups had been here and here. Well, now we see that this one group is really a high, high uh, calcium significance versus this group not having anything to do with uh, the calcium significance. And so we've now stratified based on some biologically meaningful principle that may indicate uh, responsiveness to a, a different uh, type of therapy or demanding a different type of therapy or having a different subtype. And now we can go back in and we can say, well, what was that group of patients? What drugs were they taking? And how responsive were, were they to those drugs and so on? So it's a pretty cool uh, resource where we can start integrating, even along the clinical dimensions, uh, problems like this. And uh, how we're using this today is in a patients like me kind of way. If you come in, we can look at all of your profile, all of your DNA-based information, your clinical records, uh, imaging data, whatever that may be, and we can fit you into these maps and say, what group of patients were you most similar to? And how did those patients respond to a given therapy that I may put you on and, and so on? So it's a pretty exciting time that way. But what I was showing you was uh, sort of the DNA difference, right, between these groups. And of course, the message I want to be at home today is that DNA is just one of those dimensions that we can use to split or explain these group differences. And uh, it's an important dimension, right, as we've seen with diseases like Huntington's disease. Uh, but, the pro but the problem with even Huntington's disease, where that disease-causing mutation was discovered th 30 or so years ago, right, the cause of Huntington's, um, and it gave us that knowledge, but it didn't really give us an understanding of the disease, right? 30 years later, we still don't have a cure for Huntington's. We still don't even really know all about, you know, how it uh, evolves and how it progresses. We still don't have effective treatments. So even though we accumulated that knowledge by looking at mutations that affected that gene, we didn't achieve understanding. And we see that sort of problem throughout all of the genetic studies that are not all, but nearly all of the genetic studies being published today, even you know, well-known ones like APOE, obviously APOE status, number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, discovered 19 years ago. But after billions of years of industry research and academic research on you know, trying to get to cures based on that or ways to prevent based on that information, um, we still don't. Not only do we not have uh, effective treatments based on that discovery for Alzheimer's, but we don't even really know whether APOE is the causative gene. Like it's astonishing, right? 19 years, billions of dollars of research. We have the mutation, but we don't really even know whether that's the gene. And of course, as we get into other traits like height and uh, you know uh, highly heritable traits, but very complex, you know height. I think I'm, I'm on one of the papers coming in Nature on you know the height uh, loci. I think it's up over a thousand now. It's like amazing, right? But there's a th over a thousand loci, a thousand genes. Like we don't even know what all the genes are. We don't know what pathways are operating in, and so on. So very, very complicated. So what we want to try to do to get out of the, you know, this is we, we, you know, how are we going to understand what those DNA variations are doing? Well, we're going to score lots of different dimensions of data, right? So we're not going to look at DNA alone. We're going to look at what are the consequences of changing, perturbing, you know, the, the perturbations that are induced by these DNA variations. And we're going to look at all these different molecular dimensions as well as higher order dimensions. You've heard both Art and uh, Stephen speak well about the need to embrace complexity, right, to play this to play this game, right? You can't shy away from you wanting things to be simple and linear and, and pairwise, right? You have to be able to embrace the holistic nature of uh, what we're looking at. 
And uh, the one thing, and you sort of heard this come through uh, in, in some of the earlier talks, but I want to be really clear uh, on this point, is that you know, we, our minds are going to fight us every step of the way on this embracing of complexity. And it fights us every step of the way because our minds are wired to tell stories and not to uh, uh, handle statistical uncertainty, right? So we're very, uh, we just evolved that way. We're in, you hear it from myself and the other speakers, right? We're telling stories, right? We're telling you, we're trying to pitch you a story that, that makes sense in uh, your mind. And we, this, of course, has gone on throughout human history, whether it's Zeus, the sky god, throwing down the bolts of lightning, or the Earth being the center of the universe, or the Earth being flat or that biological processes are driven by simple linearly ordered pathways, right? Those are, the, those are the simple stories we like to tell to explain the complex things that we don't really understand. And the way we break out of that want to tell stories is through technological innovation, application of that innovation, and appropriate interpretation of, of the data. So whether it's Galileo and the telescope, right, resolving the mysteries of the universe, or the very modern technologies that, again, enable us to take snapshots of these living systems to play this kind of game, that's, uh, that's where we really want to head. And one of the things that's the most important about being able to construct and embrace the complexity and construct these models is one in uh, inferring causality, right? So we, we, again, today live in this big data world where we see lots of variables being scored on individuals through the population, right? So any number of variables that you can think about, whether it's a biological, you know, your gene expression levels, or your insulin levels, or your height, or your BMI, or, or the weather, whatever the variables are, you can sample through an environment or through a population, and you can note patterns of correlation. And of course, we heard through several of the talks the importance of that correlation, and this is some of Stephen's work that he spoke briefly about on how, you know, when you have correlation patterns over many thousands of variables or hundreds of thousands of variables, you can start teasing apart those patterns. In this case is the work that Rosetta had done on breast cancer. So here you're looking at lots of breast cancer patients and all these genes that are changing over the different breast cancer patients and you see these patterns arise and you see that those patterns are very good at predicting poor from good prognosis in breast cancer. And based on that work, right, that's the Oncotest DX from Genomic Health and and so on. So that's uh, clinically very useful, but, but if we want to get down to root causes, if we want to find, you know, how do we actually prevent disease or how do we effectively treat it, we need to understand causality. And what you don't get from that association-based information are the key drivers of these patterns or the responders, right? You just get the, uh, the pattern. And so I like to show this slide just to remind us that correlation does not imply causation. Uh, so here's Brian, the fat guy, who's told by his doctor that fat guys correlate with fat dogs. So he's going to solve his weight problem by exercising the dog. And as silly as that seems, right, that locks in. That correlation doesn't imply causation. But I've worked enough in the biology community to know that when you see these beautiful patterns and you see your favorite gene in there that you've worked in your entire career on, I guarantee you, you are going to make a story up about how that gene's involved in that pattern. And, uh, but of course, the biologists aren't stupid, so they're going to do experiments to validate their hypothesis. And the way they do that is they set up an experimental system where in this case, instead of sampling through a population, you're sampling over time and you're looking at these two variables and you're seeing over time that they're correlated and then you come up with this hypothesis that this uh, changes in uh, this gene are causing changes in this clinical feature and so to validate that you set up the system you artificially perturb that gene you look at the subsequent response in this trait and based on that uh, flow of information you make your determination of uh, causality uh, the two things that I always had a problem with this as I was learning biology is one, that's a very artificial perturbation, right? So it's not something the system necessarily evolved with. It may be overly harsh. It may be uh, something that the system never had to adjust to throughout evolution. So how relevant really is it to the biology of the system? And then, of course, it's just uh, uh, not multifactorial, right? It's a single gene at a time. So what we had flipped to was using um, uh, this concept that you know, we really pioneered back in, it was around 1999-2000, the uh, published first paper on uh, this kind of idea, but it's uh, one that's now gaining in popularity, and it relates to Mendelian randomization. So if you think about how you establish causality, say, in a clinical trial, um, you know, why do we use randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials? It's because you, can, you have two arms of that trial, right? You have uh, the drug arm where you want to see some effect, and you have the placebo arm, 
and, and the way you make the causal inference is you randomize people to those arms, right? It's the randomization mechanism that enables you to, to make the causal claim if you see a difference in the, um, in the treatments between those two arms. So what we can do is leverage that exact idea, but what, what we now leverage is the DNA variation that, that nature gave us already goes through a randomization mechanism, right? It's the Mendelian chromosomal shuffling that occurs uh, when, when uh, cells are, are made. So what we can do is we can divide up the population into different genotypic groups at any given locus in the genome and we can ask, right, how do changes at this given DNA locus correlate with changes in the traits that we care about, that we want to causally order? And again, the way we can play this game is you are randomized to one of these arms, one of these genotype groups through the Mendelian shuffling, right? So when the cells divide in the, uh, during meiotic uh, divisions, the chromosomes uh, assemble, they shuffle. Uh, between the two parents in the case of mammalian genomes and, and what you get out is a randomization that enables us to play the causality game. So what we can do is say, does the variation in DNA that's correlated with the two traits that we're trying to order, if you start with this information, then there's only one of three ways that these two traits can be related. Either changes in the DNA cause changes in phenotype one and then phenotype two, or vice versa, or that change in DNA independently drives these two traits. So again, if you start with this, DNA is the perturbogen associating with these two traits, then, then these are the possibilities. So we can mathematically model that and then simply infer the model that best supports the data. And uh, I think Stephen had alluded to, you know, it's this triplet game. Once you have these three, you can start playing this game. But again, the magic of what, what we were able to do is treating DNA variation as the perturbogen. If, DNA, if that node was not a perturbogen, if it was, uh, say, another expression trait, and you wanted to play this conditional dependency game to infer this structure, well, now instead of three graphs to consider, you would have around 55 graphs to consider, right? So it's pretty amazing. So it's the, the fact that you can direct those edges off the DNA that reduces this to this three graph problem. If you had 155 graphs, and of those 155, I think roughly half or more are what, it, what we call Markov equivalent. That means they're statistically indistinguishable from one another. So no matter how much data you had, you couldn't resolve the structure. So you know, the fact that we can treat DNA as the perturbation is the, is the trick. Um, and of course, we, we then don't want to look at just pairs, right? We don't want just to look at pairs and order pairs. We want to look at the entire constellation of, of variables that we're scoring, whether it's DNA variations or gene expression or DNA protein binding or metabolite levels or clinical traits. Doesn't matter, right? The modeling's agnostic to the, to the actual type of uh, variable you're trying to fit. And we want to build these, um, these networks. Of course, another way to perturb is uh, through time. So the DNA variation is one type of perturbation we can leverage, but we can also do time series based inference using dynamic Bayesian networks. The modeling we do to build this kind of network is also Bayesian network where, again, we're manipulating the conditional mutual information measure that takes into account this DNA as the perturbation source. So we can sort of rewrite all of that in a Bayesian framework to, to, to make these networks. And again, we don't want to just operate at the molecular level. But part of the reason why I chose this multi-scale biology name for the, for the institute is that we want to think of information as flowing uh, freely between different levels of, 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 bi of biological systems. So there's the molecular, there's cellular, there's a tissue, there's organ, there's organism, there's community. Like how is information not only flowing within the molecular state, but how is it, how is it uh, communicating, communicating through different cells, through different organs, and, and now even out into whole communities, which we're seeing pretty scary effects of microbiome-induced uh, uh, propagation of, of even very complicated traits like behavior. So I think it's uh, like an amazing time we're living in that way. Um, so to show you how we um, can play this game to um, you know, get to something uh, very predictive about a disease and then how best to treat that disease, I'll talk a little bit about um, inflammatory bowel disease. So this, was a, this is a disease that's had a pretty amazing genetic success, right? Uh, 163 loci have now been identified for IBD at genome-wide significance. Yet the problem remains of what are those genes and what do they actually do and how do they work together and how do they stratify these populations into different subgroups and so on. 
So what we've done is we've built lots of different types of networks over many different cohorts, <laughs> uh, both molecular and higher order networks. And what we can do is project this kind of information in a very uh, uh, you know, data-driven way onto all the networks that we can construct and identify networks that are informing on what these variants are doing. So for example, here's uh, one of the networks that we projected the um, 163 loci onto. This, this is a network um, that we initially built from, I think it was a mental fat. So 800 individuals where they were having bariatric surgery, and uh, as part of the surgery, they removed mental fat, subcutaneous fat, stomach, uh, part of, not all the stomach, the, the liver, part of the liver, <coughs> uh, biopsy of the liver, and uh, skeletal muscle. And uh, so we took that data, and again, we genotyped everybody, we RNA profiled everybody, we had all the clinical information, and so what these nodes represent are you know, the different expression levels of genes. This is specific to a mental. Um, so the different expression levels, DNA variants that are uh, driving, associating causally with uh, those uh, expression traits, uh, different cl clinical parameters, and so on. So all the blue and pink nodes, that's what they represent. The green uh, guys are the edges. Uh, so this is getting to the, you know, the hairball, although it's beautified, uh, that Art was talking about. Um, so you have this uh, big hairball, all those green edges, but remember these are causal links, right? We've integrated the DNA variation as perturbation source to make causal inferences amongst all the nodes. Uh, so if you zoomed in, you would, you would see that kind of thing. And what was interesting is when we project the 163 loci across all the networks we had, this was the top network that came up is super enriched for nodes that were uh, part of that IBD uh, 163. So the pink nodes, or nodes that are harboring DNA variations that associate with IBD genome-wide. And you can see they're not randomly dispersed throughout the network. They're localizing in one very specific part. And the p-value for this specific localization is on the order of 10 to the minus 200. That's a, like an amazingly significant result. And all my statistical buddies, I kid around that after we corrected for all the particles in the universe, this was still very significant enrichment. So I'm pretty confident that that's something to look at. One of the ways we can project this to get a better, you know, to get out of the hairball mode is now we can zoom into this specific subnetwork to try to understand, well, how are the things actually connected and what are the, what's the information that's represented in there? So this is um, the, those pink nodes, and now we've projected them out into this 2D plot uh, where you're able to look at the actual G names and see what might be connected to what. But we can go a step further, and because we have this probabilistic causal model, we can now do simulation on all of the nodes in the network and understand or predict what the effect of perturbing them is going to be. So we can knock down and overexpress all the genes in that subnetwork and have the model tell us what's, what's, gonna, what's the uh, expression state response and clinical trait response going to be to those in silico perturbations. We can, of course, do that on a supercomputer very, very quickly in, in a matter of minutes. And uh, the first thing we do is we identify what these causal regulators, the master regulators are. Those are these bigger square nodes. So the master regulators are genes that, uh, when we perturb them in silico, have a very significant impact on the state of the network. And uh, then we can do things like color coding these peach and pink nodes. These are nodes that not only harbor variations that are associated with IBD, but the expression state of the node changes as a result of that um, uh, DNA variation that's associated with IBD. So now we can, with that kind of information, we can project out into another space and start sort of trying to understand how is information flowing through this network and what are the right nodes to hit. So now all I've done is taken um, the master regulator nodes that have been the square nodes. Those are now these big uh, nodes. And uh, so these are the master regulators of this network. This, uh, this band right here is the first layer responding most proximally to the uh, key regulators. So this, these are all causal links. Changes in these causal regulators are causing changes in this band. And then this band over here is the more downstream. You're, you're greater than a path length of one away from the, the regulator nodes. Uh, so you're more downstream. And then these guys are pretty interesting because they're you know, regulating the master regulators. And then your purple, you're activating, you're pushing up, you're green, you're suppressing, pushing down. And so there's a lot of information in here where we can start 
understanding, for example, whether the variations of those 163 loci are they, where, what what nodes are they most uh, likely to impact? So, for example, of the IBD loci, the key regulator nodes are very under enriched for harboring variations that associate with IBD, whereas the first uh, layer nodes are, um, I think, almost twofold more enriched than they are if you look over the whole network. Like the whole network is like tenfold enriched for harboring variations that affect IBD, but that band in the middle is 20-fold enriched on, on that order. So that tells us how, uh, you know, what nodes are being targeted and where we may want to target therapy. For example, we may not want to be messing around with the master regulator nodes uh, because this has a very immune uh, inflammation uh, related component that this network is performing and you may not want to take down uh, the immune system or, or overactivate it you know, to an extent where it obliterates other parts of the system. So we uh, think a lot about where's the right place to be targeting. And then we sort of get into how is information actually flowing uh, through this network from the standpoint of different biological processes. So in this particular plot, what I, this is a 3D circos plot, and what I've now done is, uh, uh, and I say I, uh, this is uh, a lot of these uh, ways of visualizing this information I've done in collaboration with um, uh, Zainab uh, Gamas at uh, Cornell, just an, another one of these very brilliant physics, physics types who uh, decided to get, dedicate her life to visualizing big data, network data. So what I've done now is I've taken the different um, the nodes and organized them by, by uh, different biological processes. So these different colored triangles, these represent different biological processes, and so we've oriented the nodes to be in uh, whatever process they're a part of. But now what we've done is we've collapsed the edges. If nodes are uh, communicating with other nodes through, through common paths in the network. So if you're going through a common path, you start collapsing those nodes down and making them closer together, and what you start seeing emerging are these big arteries. And so these big arteries start showing you how information from one uh, given process is flowing through to other biological processes. So we can actually start understanding you know, how affecting one whole uh, subnetwork may impact other biological processes with, that are defined in that same network. And that, of course, becomes very important for um, uh, therapeutic intervention. The, uh, the cool thing about this uh, network that we found for IBD, um, so again, this, this network is very enriched for um, immune, uh, both innate and adaptive immunity genes and uh, inflammation. Uh, we've seen this network a lot in other diseases, and one thing that was interesting is the network Stephen showed for um, Alzheimer's disease is uh, nearly identical to this network that we identify for IBD. So it's pretty interesting that if you have disruptions in this network in a context that's in the gut, you, you're getting IBD. And if you have disruptions in this network that are occurring in the brain, you're getting Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so we started looking more generally at this uh, sort of a network and we decided to create uh, signatures for all the different disease models um, that we were seeing sort of a, uh, an inflammation immune component. So we had uh, APOE, uh, atherosclerosis model, a diabetes model, inflammatory pain, COPD, asthma, fibrosis, uh, and so on. So all these, I think, 12 different disease models. And what we're doing is we're in the relevant tissue for that disease, and we're looking at what are the changes in uh, gene expression between the disease state and the normal state, uh, the control state for those uh, different disease models. And the genes that are given along the columns are the genes that are in the network that I've been talking about. And now you're looking at the expression levels of those genes uh, over these different models. And what you should see is like, wow, that's pretty similar. Uh, so here you're seeing a network that uh, its state is highly reflected uh, across all of these different disease conditions. And again, our prediction is that this thing is causal, you know, causing uh, disease, not, not responding, not a response of uh, the disease. So then we take it a step further and we say, okay, so now we have this network. We're pretty sure it's a key driver of all these different diseases. So how do we get to some therapeutic um, intervention? And so now what we're doing is, uh, so the blue nodes now are this special network I've been showing you. And now the green nodes are all of the drugs um, on the market or coming through trials um, 
and they're either known or predicted to interact with uh, nodes that are in this network. So we now, now want to make, so again, we want to get out of this view of thinking that we're going to solve a really complicated disease by hitting a single gene, right? That's uh, like maybe some people still believe that. Uh, and maybe there are some conditions where that exception holds, but that is an exception, not the rule. And so what we have here, all the, and you just look at this, right? So here are all the marketed drugs where they're either known or predicted to interact with the coding products of these genes. And then the pink nodes are the different diseases that we have associated with different parts of the network. So what we want to be doing now is canvassing over this space to understand what combinations of drugs might we have to uh, uh, apply to put this network into a more normal state, to transform it from a disease state into a, a healthy state. And one of the ways we've been thinking about that, so this is a little cruder of a way of doing it, but hopefully you'll see the value in what was done here for how we can, you know, we can play this game to actually get at novel treatments for, uh, for these diseases. So what we want to do is uh, take these different compendia that have been generated, much like uh, the one Stephen had done uh, with Tim Hughes and others at um, uh, Rosetta. You think of the yeast experiment he talked about. But now we're leveraging things like the connectivity map that are based on that idea, but now it's looking at all the drugs and the impacts they have on a number of cell lines, and you're looking at the transcription as the readout. right? So you have this big compendium of data of drugs and, uh, and the different genes that change as a result of these drugs in different cell systems. And then we have the different uh, networks uh, that define disease individuals. And what we want to do is basically intersect these to identify what are the drugs that push the genes in the right direction for the networks that define this group of disease individuals, right? So we're going to integrate that information to come up with novel therapeutics. So Joel Dudley, uh, who out of Stanford, he recently joined uh, my group um, department, uh, sort of pioneered this uh, sort of uh, way of integrating all the big public data with disease-based data to come up with novel therapeutics. In, the, one of the, in applying this to the IBD case, uh, you know, the one thing that was found was uh, I, the identification of tapiramate as a potential IBD treatment. So tapiramate right, is, a, is an anti-seizure drug. And how many of you, just raise your hands, said, was thinking about how tapiramate could be used for IBD? Right? There's, <laughs> nobody was thinking about how tapiramate, an anti-seizure drug, could be used for IBD, yet uh, Joel identified it as a key uh, therapeutic for IBD, again, based on this information of integrating the, the molecular response that tapiramate induces across these lines and intersecting it with these signatures, these networks that define the disease, at least a subtype of the disease. And so what he did then is, uh, of course, that's the prediction, and now we need to do the validation. Uh, so he had a... Uh, an IBD uh, model for IBD that's uh, in, it's, so it's an induced uh, form. You treat them with something bad, and they get uh, this uh, response. <laughs> it's not not good. And and then he treated them, right? He treated them with tapiramate, and he treated them with the market leading drug uh, for IBD. And the tapiramate treated guys responded had a better profile uh, than the the market leading drug. So again, you know, just something you never would have thought of. And they have another very cool one. I think it's uh, Impress at Cell uh, for small uh, lung cell carcinoma, uh, where again they made this connection. It was a, an antidepressant that nobody on the planet would have thought had any utility for lung cancer. And uh, not only did it outperform, uh, you know, did it perform very well in animal models, but it outperformed the, the current market leading drugs for small lung cell carcinoma and is now in a clinical trial um, at Stanford. So given that sort of thing, how, do we, how can we bring all this information together to um, impact uh, decision making in real time in a, in a clinical arena? And so to do that, I'll tell you about our personalized cancer therapy program that we're running at Mount Sinai that I, is one of the most exciting projects I'm involved in. And uh, the idea is to bring those, those sorts of models I've been talking about and the ways we can connect to treatments and bring it to bear on, on um, patients that are actually uh, being diagnosed and, and how best to treat them. So we're basically taking terminal cases. Um, so these are cancer cases where the patients aren't responding to the 
you know, standard of care frontline therapies, um, and the prognosis is not good. And so what we're doing is uh, isolating tumor RNA DNA and germline DNA, sequencing all of that. Um, but now, unlike um, many other groups who are obviously doing this, we're not just looking at the mutations, somatic mutations and structural uh, um, changes that are going on in this patient's tumor. We're projecting that information onto the network models that we'll, we build from, for the different types of cancer and then using that model to inform what, what is disrupted in this patient and then how do we target that sub-network. So it differs, you know, strikingly from efforts like Foundation Medicine or TGen or these other efforts where they, you know, they basically, they look at those mutations and they try to match them to known, you know, KRAS or PA3 kinase or P10. You know, they want to see what are the mutations that are occurring in these known key drivers and if they make that match, then it's good. But the problem is that most of the times there is no such match. Uh, but we'll, we'll find it and I'll show you, show you an example of how we can achieve success where, where that strategy fails. So, so what we do is we take that information, project it onto these models, and we identify the subnetworks that are disrupted. What are the key drivers of that subnetwork? And then we do three different ways we can come up with novel treatments for those uh, patients. We can do a chemigenomic screen against those key drivers to identify, you know, almost in the Joel Dudley kind of way, what are the, the therapies that could target that network that are existing or coming through trials. We can take the multifactorial hits that are in that patient's tumor and build it in the fly. So we work with Ross Kagan, who's had a number of very cool nature papers on how this can be done. And then we, in high throughput screening mode, screen those flies, that patient's tumor in the fly against all existing drugs and all combinations of drugs. Um, and for those that hit, we have the patient tumor put into the mouse, the xenograft stuff that uh, Stephen talked about, and you give the drug there. And if that works, then it goes directly into the patient. So that's number two. And number three is we're identifying, you know, CD8 epitope uh, predictions from the disrupted proteins in these networks. Ident so we're identifying those things that are immunogenic, and then we're designing novel vaccines against those, um, against those immunogenic genes, and then doing a trial where we're, you know, basically injecting, you know, there's about a four to eight week turnaround time in doing that generation. We inject that into the patient, and then we're profiling the tumor to see whether the immune system is being engaged uh, against the tumor. So just as, a, as an example, first of all, and how important it is to be interpreting in the context of a network-based view versus a single uh, mutation, you know, are you seeing mutations in these known driver genes, is reflected in, in this sort of plot where what, what, this is uh, from a breast cancer paper we have coming. Um, a network model that we did there. So we build this network model, and now what we've done is projected onto that network model all the whole uh, genome sequencing data that was generated, I believe, on 50 to 100 breast cancer cases that weren't used to build the network, but we're going to see whether how it organizes that mutational information. And some of the subnetworks, so we have a subnetwork in that breast cancer model that <coughs> reflects chromatin modification. And when we look at the different nodes in the network, so remember, we have this network. We can have the master key driver genes, the, the next layer, and then the downstream. So the global drivers are the, the master regulator genes that aren't regulated by anything else. So they're sort of the most upstream key drivers. We have local drivers, which again are master regulators, but they're regulated by something. And then we have all the other uh, genes in the subnetwork, and then everything that's not in the network. And what you notice when we look at the mutations that recur in the breast cancer um, population in this particular subnetwork, we see a 30, nearly 32-fold enrichment for mutations occurring in these global driver genes as opposed to the local drivers, as opposed to uh, module genes, as opposed to non-network genes. So that's a pretty dramatic enrichment. And the, the coolest thing about this result is nine times out of 10, that key driver gene is not a transcription factor and it is not a signaling molecule. And if you look at all these other screens that are being done, whether it's Hutigen or foundation medicine, they're looking at transcription factors and signaling molecule genes. And what we're showing is nine times out of 10, that's not the right, that you're gonna miss it. Um, so this sort of enrichment, very encouraging. Again, we can use other perturbation sources like methylation. We see the same kinds of patterns going on. Um, you know, again, the type of mutation, our modeling's uh, agnostic uh, to that, so we can take in things like methylation or environmental stresses or drug perturbations, doesn't matter. 
And so um, what I'll, I'll show briefly, a, a glioblastoma case uh, that we took on uh, using this approach. So again, we take tumor biopsy, sequence all the DNA, <laughs> RNA, and the germline DNA. We project it onto a model of glioblastoma that we built. So in TCGA, there are 552 glioblastoma uh, uh, samples that have been profiled, and roughly 100 or so of those have been uh, sequenced. Uh, so we, we build the model, predict the model based on that data, and now we project the patient's information onto that network, and then we try to inform what's going on in that patient based on uh, how the mutations are breaking out. And so here's just an example of this particular patient and the information projected onto the network. So the, so the glioblastoma network has around 10,000 nodes in the network in total. And uh, when we project the patient's information onto this network, we, get, we see this subnetwork. It's about 1,000 genes. All the blue nodes are nodes that are mutated, um, harbor mutations that we've detected. Over 50%, or it's around 50% of the mutations in this patient and against other glioblastoma cases are concentrated <clears throat> into this single subnetwork of 1,000 genes. So even though these 1,000 genes are, represent 10% of the network, they're harboring half of all the mutations that are occurring or affecting this. So clear selection going on for uh, this network being modified. And again, we see known genes that aren't necessarily mutated that would be missed, right? If you, this subnetwork would be missed if you were looking at just mutations in the known genes. But all the genes around uh, some of these known genes are mutated and, and uh, our prediction is activating uh, the network. So now that we have this network, we can go in and now do our chemigenomic screen to say what are the drugs that target this specific uh, network. But remember, this is specific to the patient, right? It's not, it's not a general uh, prediction. It's specific to the changes that have occurred in this patient. And then here's the, response, uh, the, the end uh, result of uh, the screen that we did. And uh, it's broken out into uh, where you fall in the network. So again, we have all these drugs. We have the expression response to those drugs, and we've now screened this network against those signatures. And we've rank ordered all the drugs that we profiled, uh, rank ordered them by how well they impacted the network. And so I'll just highlight arinotecan. Uh, so it's an existing therapy. I think it's uh, maybe used for colon cancer. Um, and we see that if we look at all the cancer network genes and its effect on those genes in the glioblastoma network, that this guy ranks uh, down in the noise. Like you'd never, uh, we wouldn't make a match based on uh, looking at all the glioblastoma cases and uh, uh, trying to connect to arena TCAN. And the beautiful part of that is studies have been done with arena TCAN and glioblastoma, and it had no, uh, uh, you know, the trials weren't uh, successful, although there were responders within those trials. The trials uh, in total didn't achieve the efficacy needed to carry that forward. So now let's go to the patient specific, that thousand gene subnetwork, and we see the ranking now increase, although still not at a level that would get us super excited. But by the time we get to the key drivers that are very specific to that patient, arinotecan is the top hitting gene, uh, uh, top hitting drug. So what this, uh, what we hypothesize then is happening here is this particular patient has the types of changes that would make them responsive to this particular therapy, even though over the general glioblastoma population, this wouldn't necessarily um, uh, be the case. But remember, in those trials, there were responders. It's just locking onto what's the, what's the signature uh, to identify the responders. So based on, that, um, based on that information, the treating oncologist, so the way we then work this is we come up with this whole, line, you know, we do this turnaround now, we're doing, um, you know, it takes us, uh, you know, with the pathologists, and the pathologists are very important, by the way, I learned. Uh, we can't do this without, you know, they have to be looking at that sample and they're getting this, you know, what they're going to send us because what you're sequencing is very important. Um, you know, so we have the pathologist gets us a sample. By the time we get the sample, we do a rapid run on a high C2500, so we're turning that around in 27 hours. It's actually around 32 because we have to build the sequencing um, uh, library. And the analysis then takes another three or four days. So literally in about a week, um, we have a report that we can then sit down with the treating oncologist, the pathologist, the patient, in many cases, the genetic counselor, the informaticist, and we discuss you know, what's, what's going on. 
uh, and whether we can uh, impact uh, the treatment. In this case, the treating oncologist was motivated to give arena tcan in combination with uh, some new therapy that was uh, either just approved or being approved. I'm uh, forgetting on the name. Uh, and so that's sort of all ongoing, and I don't have the outcome <laughs> yet on this patient. The patient actually went into really violent seizures and the therapy got held up because he was in the ICU and it got more complicated. But in any case, this is the kind of thing we're doing. We have clinical trials now going in head and neck and multiple myeloma where the aim is to use this sort of infra in the why we chose those is we had physicians who said, if you tell me, like, there's nothing I'm going to do for this patient that's going to help. So if you tell me to put this patient on this drug because of this information, I will put that patient on this drug. So the trial is to randomize people who are being informed in this way versus people who are getting standard of care, and we'll run that and see you know, whether we see a significant difference in the outcomes. Uh, so those are going both for multiple myeloma and head and neck. More generally, we you know, are pretty into you know, we don't want to just restrict to cancer, right? We think this utility exists for all other diseases as well. And so we have lots of studies uh, going on where, again, the aim is to just build up massive amounts of information on individual patients to, you know, basically get to the proofs of concept on how all of this information can be appropriately integrated and do far better on informing on that patient health than sort of classical um, assays that would have been run in, in medicine. So really getting at Stephen's point on you know, that maybe it's not the pathology image at the end of the day that's the gold standard, but it's all this other information that's integrated together that best informs uh, on what's going on in uh, the patient. Uh, and of course, the whole idea of generating this information in po populations, you know, the beauty of Mount Sinai, like why I was attracted to Mount Sinai, is we could play, you know, get to the proof of concept more quickly because we're embedded in a medical center where, where we have this kind of information. And the whole idea of going after this patients like me idea that we can take a patient based on all their profile information, find the group of patients they most resemble, and then help diagnose and treat them based on that information, uh, outcomes of the local groups that, that they fit into. And then just as the last slide is, is just on uh, the future vision of where we hope this all goes. And it's uh, you know, basically getting for you uh, a topographical map that maps out your health course as you're living your life and that helps inform you on the trajectories you're on on that particular health map. Uh, to uh, live a healthier life. And so this is the type of maps we're uh, playing around with. So these maps are constructed by taking multiple networks uh, that are in different states that reflect different conditions and projecting them into the space. So for example, we may have a network that well reflects uh, normal, uh, uh, normal states of an individual versus a particular disease state. So these multiple networks have been mapped into this space. So the XY coordinates in this space are reflective of uh, different states of the networks that are mapped. So given all the different variable uh, uh, realizations in a given individual is going to tell you which state you're in. And then the z-axis is giving you the, is an energy function that basically gives you the probability that you're in any one of those states given the realization of, of the variables that are being scored in, in yourself. And um, What's pretty cool about this is you start seeing, you know, based on this type of um, modeling, we can make these contours um, between the states that are basically how do we transform the network to go from one state to the next? That's what the contours are. And the contours naturally define, each contour defines what are the genes that you would target, and not only target in direction, but quantitatively how you would target them to move you from one state to the next. So along any one of these contours, there could be three or four or more genes with a designation of, you know, you knock this gene down threefold, you pump this gene up fivefold, you knock this gene down fifteenfold, and so on. Like, you get that kind of information, and, it, and, and that is what's going to take you along this trajectory of going from one state to the next. So the hope would be, and this isn't made up, this is an actual map that Ray Chang out of UC San Diego, who now works with me on this, uh, sort of pioneered this for stem cell differentiation uh, when they were trying to look for better recipes of reprogramming fibroblasts to stem cells. But we're now applying this in the disease uh, context mapping. And the idea ultimately would be, you know, maybe this is 10, 20 years away, but it would be like on your smartphone, you have your, your topographical health map, 
and what trajectory you're on and then giving advice on either how to stay on that trajectory if it's, if it's in a steady state around the normal state or how to jump off a trajectory that's taking you towards a disease state or how to get you on a trajectory from a disease state to go to a healthy state. Because as we start making the kinds of maps I showed, you know, the, those genes, you know, small molecules may be one way to affect those genes, but diet change may be another way, or exercise may be another way, or you know, other natural products may be ways that we can uh, ensure you're on the right trajectory. So this is the kind of thinking that we have uh, going on and that we hope, uh, you know, it's a little, uh, you know, it's early days, like we don't know how well this is going to work, but that's the, that's the vision. So I wanted to thank um, the crew at Mount Sinai. It's been uh, a lot of fun building that effort out. Uh, we obviously have lots of academic collaborators. Uh, of course, Sage uh, still very much a part. Uh, you saw the Alzheimer's work that Stephen talked about. Um, so still a lot of interaction going on there. And uh, thank you for your attention.